Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Cuban Healthcare, The Ongoing Revolution, featuring Don Fitz. Don Fitz is a Green Party activist who earned his doctorate degree from the University of Texas at Austin in 1974. He taught environmental psychology at Washington University and Fontbonne University in St. Louis, and was also a research psychologist at St. Louis State Hospital for 26 years. He was the Missouri Green Party candidate for governor in 2016 and for state auditor in 2018. Currently, he serves on the editorial board of Green Social Thought. Don and I spoke on August 26th about his new book, Cuban Healthcare, The Ongoing Revolution. First, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed your book. It was, it was very interesting. I, I had no idea that what was going on in Cuba was so much further ahead of where the U.S. is in so many different ways. A lot of people are aware that the U.S. healthcare system certainly needs its improvements, but seeing the example of Cuba was like, wow, look at that, this tiny little island that's been suffering under economic warfare from the United States for 50 or 60 years, and yet has managed to put together this very plainly effective system. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I, that I mentioned but I didn't really emphasize enough was that Cuba was perfectly willing to learn from the Soviet Union and from the Eastern European countries. And if they told them to do something they didn't want to do, they said, okay, we won't do it. <laughs> and they just threw away, you know, they, they learned, but they changed everything they wanted, you know, to fit a Cuban uh, context. Right, right. Yeah, I was also impressed about your book in that, you uh, were not merely a cheerleader for uh, Cuba or their healthcare system, but that you are pointing out the different issues that they had along the way, too, and the challenges that they had and the failures and the ways that they needed to improve things. Yeah, I was happy when Monthly Review was willing to publish an article that I wrote that I said, uh, and the first article they, that I published in Monthly Review that was a little bit critical of Cuba pointed out that they did such things, uh, really backward things like criticize, like criminalizing marijuana, which is still the case. And they also wanted to build a nuclear power plant, which would have been a disaster. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not really encouraged when people write articles where they're doing nothing but cheerleading in Cuba and refusing to point out, you know, there's problems here and there. Actually, there's a lot of problems. Right, right. But in terms of the healthcare system, I think I'd like to start off our discussion talking about the some of the differences, and I know that's a huge, huge question, but some of the differences between that their system and our system, specifically the ones that are um, positive differences on their part. Okay, well, the differences between Cuba and the United States are enormous, and I can summarize three of them, but that, that still leaves out a huge amount. One is that the Cuban health system begins with the concept of Medicare for all. In other words, that's what happened immediately after the revolution was that many of the poor people, the rural people, the black people, and those tended to overlap a lot, uh, did not receive medical care, never seen a doctor. And so the first task of the revolution for the first four or five years was to extend medical care to everybody on the island. Then uh, what developed over the years was that every part of the Cuban health care system was integrated into a whole. Now, this, this is incredibly different from the United States. The United States has a policy for national level that ignores all sorts of things, and then different states have different policies, and then different counties and different cities have different policies, and the typical physician or physician's group has to deal with hundreds of different medical care plans. And so the, the Cuban system is very simple. That's one of the many reasons it costs so much less than the United States. There's not, not all these multiple plans and multiple systems. There's a single unified system 
that they spent 35 years developing. And everybody uh, fits into that system, which leads into the third point that I want to make about the Cuban system, is that everybody feeds into the system. And you can really see this when there's a crisis, uh, like a dengue epidemic or some other, that's a mosquito-borne illness, or some other health problem, and especially came up with with COVID-19. Because when when there's a real medical crisis, what happens is that the medical students leave medical school, they don't leave medical school, but they have a new assignment, and that's to, to go around to the neighborhood doctor's office each medical student being assigned to a neighborhood doctor, and the doctor tells them what to ask people. First of all, they find out what people need. This is in stark contrast to the U.S., where if you want to get treatment for COVID, you have to go in. You have to ask them to get tested, and you may or may not get tested. You you probably will not need get the things that you need, but in Cuba, the the medical system goes to you to find out what you need, and if you need to stay at home because they don't want you to infect somebody else, then the medical system works with the other systems to make sure what the person needs. And so the information that the medical students get from the neighborhoods they go to then flows in to the neighborhood doctor's office. The neighborhood doctor looks at a map. He makes red dots for people who might have COVID-19, or that's what they did at the beginning of the epidemic. Uh, In August 2020, the epidemic is pretty much... uh, conquered in Cuba, in Cuba. Okay, so the doctor's office would make a red dot, and they would look for areas that were hot spots and needed, to, needed more quarantine, needed more uh, extra assistance. Then the doctor's office would take, the, uh, the doctor in the neighborhood office would take that to the clinic. And the clinic doctors would go over it. With, you know, the clinic doctors from the different neighborhoods would look at that as, as, long, as well as the clinic doctors, and they would summarize that information and they would send it to the national health care system. And then the specialist who had experience from all over Cuba would take that information and, and they would uh, advise the government what the policy should be. And so the, the policy of, that was, arose from the national health care system was actually began with interviews with citizens. And so you have 11 million people, which is the entire population of Cuba, giving information to the government, which designs the health care system. And then, then the politicians, they don't act anything like American politicians. They don't say, well, what slogan would help me get elected? How can I help defend uh, private corporations and get them the most uh, money? The policies, the governmental policies, are driven directly by what the senior physicians in the health care system tell them and they map out the policy from that, and the role of the government is then to publicize it and to get everybody on board. And people get on board because they know that the government, they have had input into the system, and the government is actually listening to the people and hearing what their problems are and dealing with them. Right, and they've had um, instances in their history uh, in which they've seen this happen before, in which they've seen that they can, that they can trust their government well, a- absolutely. I mean, like like a, g- a good example is dengue. And, and Cuba did a lot of work in 1981 with dengue. Like I said, it's a mosquito-borne illness. It hits Cuba every 10 to 15 years. There's an epidemic. And so what happens is the medical students, again, my, my daughter, when she was in medical school in Cuba, called me up one time, or I called her up, and she said, listen, I'm going to be on dengue duty. <laughs> and what, that's, what that meant was her classes were over, by and large, and she spent a lot of time going around, interviewing people door-to-door. And then part of interviewing people door-to-door is you walk through their house and you say something like, okay, well, you have a plant here growing, which is a, a breeding plant for mosquitoes. You've got to get rid of that plant. You have standing water here that can host mosquito larvae. You've got to get that fixed. And, and then the person might say, well, there's, I don't have enough money you know, to get the standing water problem fixed. And then it's up to the medical student to then – make sure that the doctor in the doctor's office knows about that and then they make they do what they need to do so that there's not standing water that attracts mosquitoes one of the things which is very interesting about that is that no medical student would ever report illegal activity going on in the home 
And there's a lot of illegal activity going on in homes in Cuba. But part of this is because there's government regulation of all sorts of things like restaurants and how, you know, can you have a private business on your own? And all sorts of Cubans have little things going on on the side. And all of the medical students, all of the doctors know you're not going to report on people, you know, or what what they're doing is outside of government restrictions. You're there to to notice health problems and health problems alone. And so Cubans have decades of experience knowing that they're not going to be reported for anything illegal that they're doing. Now, in the United States, I mean, nobody would, would – not nobody, but huge numbers, millions, tens of millions of people would not allow somebody to walk through their home, walk through their yard, and inspect it for how you might be doing something that would be illegal. I mean, people couldn't do that. They'd be met with shotguns at somebody's front door. And so it's a, a totally different attitude in Cuba by the entire population regarding medical care. Uh, yeah, it sounds like the, the the doctors and the medical establishment there really has, you know, earned the trust of the people there by doing a good job. Well, yeah, and that comes from the first days of the revolution, 1959, because the many, one of the, some of the many things that the uh, Cuban revolutionaries promised was health care, health care for all. And, Che Guevara was instrumental in that. Che Guevara, of course, was a physician. He was from Argentina, and he was very close to Fidel Castro. And he helped make the changes for the, the, for the revolution. And this was, this was a profound change, especially for black Cubans. And huge numbers of Cubans are of African descent. So the, during the 1960s, there were black Cubans who had never gone to a doctor before. If they had, they had very limited care. And they could see clinics going up around when they, where they lived. They could see a literacy campaign that taught everybody how to read and write. And then if they turned on their TV, TV if they had one or went to a friend, I mean, not everybody had TV in the early 1960s in Cuba. Uh, but if they were watching a TV some other place, they would see black people in the United States being beaten in clubs and attacked by dogs, asking for the right to sit down at a lunch counter or ride a bus without going to the back of the bus. And so especially for black Cubans, right after the revolution, the difference was so extreme between what they saw happening in Cuba and what they knew happening was happening in the United States that they realized from the very beginning that the government policies were changing in order to help the very poor. Right, right. And and the there's been a number of phases you described in your book uh, that happened with health care beginning at that time. So they started out with what uh, you were what what is what are called polyclinics and then went through a couple of different phases before sort of getting to where where things are now. And it seemed like each of those phases maybe uh, was trying to correct errors of previous ones. But the whole time, it seemed like uh, there was a there was a real fo there was a real improvement going on in people's health and in the quality of care they were getting. Yeah, let, let, let me just summarize thirty five years of changes in just a couple of minutes. Okay, after the revolution, you know, w within the first few years of the revolution, half of the doctors, not half, almost half, about forty five percent, left Cuba for Miami, and so what that meant. And the revolution had promised improved health care that would reach everybody on the island. So what they had to do was to vastly expand health care with half, barely half as many doctors there. At the same time, they had to redesign the medical schools. And at the same time, they had to redesign the entire health care system. So for the first five years of the revolution, really the only thing they could do was to expand medical care. And so what they did was to take the basic model of medical care that was existent in the United States and Cuba at, this, at that time and expand it throughout the island. One of the things which they did, I actually, they actually shut down a few hospitals because they did not want an excess of hospitals in rural areas. They wanted clinics that could service everybody across the island. And so they expanded the number of cl clinics dramatically so that everybody would have a clinic either in their urban neighborhood or in their rural area that they could reach. And so that they had the, the first phase of the clinics that started roughly 
five years after the revolution, uh, roughly 1964. So they had the clinics, and then as time went on for the first 10 years, they realized that the clinics were not sufficiently co connected to the neighborhood. And so they realized going into 1974, they need to make dramatic changes, and these changes were extremely dramatic in 1974, and they changed the entire design of the clinic. And so I asked a physician when I was in Cuba to say, okay, what were the changes going on then? And he said that the changes that happened roughly 1974, a few years before and a few years after, was the change of people going to the clinics, the clinics going to the people. And so what happened was that before people had to come to the clinics if they needed help, if they had a problem. In 1974, there were um, a community, they changed the name to community clinics. And those clinics did just what I described a few minutes ago, and that is they developed ways to go to the people in the neighborhood. And so that was what went into effect in 1974. In as they went through the next 10 years, as they approached 1984, they realized that the, they, though they were going to the community, they weren't sufficiently connected to the community. And so in 1984 was when they first introduced the doctor-nurse uh, teams in the community, and their the doctor's offices are called consultorios, uh, and it, basically what they did was they set up a doctor-nurse team in every neighborhood, in every rural area of Cuba, and so they would have roughly 1,500 uh, patients in their uh, catchment area, which is really not very many, and so beginning in 1984, every person was expected to go to the neighborhood doctor's office and the neighborhood doctor went to every uh, everybody in the neighborhood. And so one time when I was in Havana, I said, I asked the physician when I was visiting a, a consultorio, a doctor's office, I said, okay, I, I need to ask you this for an American audience. How do you get to people's homes when you visit them at home? And he looked at me like I was totally crazy, and he said, well, I walk there. Mm -hmm. And I said, that, that's great. I just had to ask you that because I don't think there's a whole lot of Americans who could say, the last time I saw a doctor, he walked to my house. Yeah, that's... And, and the, the, this is the way that community, the, the core basic unit of community medicine is the link between the neighborhood doctor and, and, the, and, and the person. That, in, in other, for, for the typical thing that they did in the city in 1984, it was that they would find an abandoned three-story house if there was one, and this, uh, the, the you know, it would be uh, um, an apartment, you know, with three units. And so, typically, the the first floor would then be the consultorio, the nurse or the doctor would live on the second floor, and the nurse of, of the other person would live on the third floor with their families. And so, the the doctor and the nurse would be part of the community. Yeah, that's just so radically different than what we see here. It's uh, almost unimaginable. Well, I mean, one of the things which is unimaginable is that in, in the United States, we're an extremely mobile population. I mean, the typical person, I, th I think, moves on the average of every five years. Of course, some people stay in the same place. I've been in my house for 33 years. Some people move like every year. Uh, and especially low-income people are always being pushed out because of crises, and, and low-income people in the United States move a lot, as do young people. But that doesn't happen in most Latin American countries, and especially in Cuba, people tend to stay in the same area for decades. So consequently, uh, a physician know, can get to know everybody in the neighborhood very well because they're, they're, they're part of the same community which has been there for a while. Right. Yeah. And there's a number of, of economic and, and political factors over the last 50 years that have caused that mobile mobility in the U.S. population, you know, and too much to get into today. But but obviously the the the, the Cubans didn't have the same thing happen as happened here with the first the emptying out of the cities of certain classes of people as the suburbs were created. And then uh, the sort of boomerang of gentrification that happened later that that, you know, has 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 led to. Uh, a lack of stability this whole time. Yeah, and, and of course, uh, U.S. cities tend to be the opposite of cities in most of the world, because in U.S. cities, 
the middle class, upper middle class especially, lives in the suburbs. And in most of the rest of the world, the word suburb means poor people who are living away from the urban center. Right. And, so it's, it's, and of course, there's been a, a trend in the last couple of decades for wealthier people to move towards downtown areas, but it, it, it's still very shaky in the U.S. as far as what's going to happen in the future. Right. Right. Okay. So, so in in, in Cuba, basically, more uh, healthcare is is uh, more available to more people than in the United States uh, in general. The system is more integrated. The system is also not a profit based uh, system. So, those are all these different structural differences. But then there's also a difference in the in the kind of care that is given, uh, is with the impression I got from your book too. And you talked about uh, something called MGI, which is an integrated form of healthcare. Yes, MGI uh, stands for Medicina General Integral. In English, it's General Comprehensive Medicine. Okay. And this was something that they, as they were developing community medicine and doctors in the community before and during 1984, you know, these changes take several years. You don't just suddenly have it happen in a single year. But 1984 was the crux of, of that change. One of the many things that they did was to address the fact that over the first 25 years of the revolution, there was still a tendency to believe that specialists, you, you know, were where you needed to go in medicine. And if you were a general practitioner, you are nothing but a general practitioner. And in medical culture in the United States today, that's pretty much the thinking. In other words, general medicine is what you do if you're not good enough to be a specialist. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted to confront that in Cuba because they thought that was a major barrier to developing good neighborhood medicine. And so what they did was to develop a specialty in neighborhood medicine. And so you go through medical school, and after you get, you're certified as a physician, you can go back and get certification. And you can get certification as a neurologist, uh, specializing in diseases of the nervous system, cardiologist, specializing in cardiological diseases, uh, all the other specialties of medicine, and now it included family medicine. And so you could get advanced training in family medicine which would put you on the, on the same rank with other specialists. And what you would focus on is extended study of what are the most common illnesses that happen in the community and how they've changed over the last few decades, what you have to do for them. And also what would, what would happen, uh, you, you, would, you would study how to be thoroughly integrated into the medical system because a, a community doctor a neighborhood doctor in Cuba is not somebody who just isolates himself in the community. He is thoroughly integrated with the local polyclinic. He will actually do a, a day every week or two inside the polyclinic. He reports, he goes to meetings at the polyclinic to report his data. He becomes very familiar with everything that happens at the polyclinic, and at the same time, that he or she becomes very familiar with everything that happens in the hospital, and is, is, is pretty, and, and also is pretty much attuned to the research institutes because a lot of what the neighborhood doctors will do is to supervise medical students who gather information during a crisis situation. Actually, all the time they're, they're constantly collecting data, and, and so the family doctor is plugged into every other aspect of the system. And the specialty in family medicine would then give the family doctor the same status as a specialist in any other area. Right. And so the it sounds like what's happening here is that there is, uh, well, it sounds as though there's much less administrative uh, type, type, the, the, like the administrative paperwork end that happens in the U.S. as related to insurance and all that, so that there can be more focus on actually being part of the research part of medicine as well. You're right, and, and, and so we, I don't know that we could say that there's less paperwork in Cuba. It's I, I haven't really studied that, but it's more like what you're saying at the end. They're doing different sorts of things. 
in other words, the, the physician's not trained in how to bill people. <laughs> they have right. no idea how to bill people. Nobody's built for anything, you know. But they they are trained in how to collect data for the research institute, for the clinics, and for the research institutes, you know, because the the different layers of the medical system are based upon receiving accurate information from other layers of the medical system. So a family doctor has to know how to supervise medical students when they're collecting data from the neighborhoods. And so th that will take a bit of time, you know, because they, they want to make sure that everything's in, in a coherent way. Uh, I mean, another thing about the medical system in Cuba is that the data is made available very quickly at every level. The data on a person is collect, collected at the neighborhood level, and the neighborhood doctor is responsible for that. And so if that person has a more severe problem, then the doctor can pull that from the file in that person and make copies for the clinic. Or if the person has to go into the hospital, the neighborhood doctor will get that information and make sure that the hospital has all of the information. Uh, in the U.S., I mean, I personally have had problems with information being transferred from one system to another. I, I remember one time I was I was scheduled for hemorrhoid surgery, and that could not. And I was uh, unfortunately I made the mistake of scheduling my surgery for January in the month of November. Well, that didn't work so well because the the system, the um, mental health system that I was working on in St. Louis, changed providers at the end of the year, and so I had to go through getting a new exam from a new medical. Um, provider that was not one of the old provider and rescheduling the hospital visit. Now, nothing like that would ever happen in Cuba. It would be unimaginable. Right. And, and I think it bears repeating what you mentioned at the very beginning of that, that nobody is billed for anything. Absolutely. Right. I mean, if you go, if you go to the pharmacy, you might have to pay 25 cents for something. They, 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 they don't want to just give medicines away for absolutely nothing. Um, but, but, but I mean, especially since they're co they're more costly than in the United States. But that your visit to the physician for an exam or for whatever reason, there's never any bill for that. I mean, that's really a dramatic difference because people here in the United States live in mortal terror of of medical bills. Absolutely, and no, uh, uh, nobody, you know, it's it's unimaginable in Cuba. For somebody to have to give up their house or give up food for medical treatment, that, that just simply does not happen. Right, right. And it's unimaginable for most Americans, uh, you know, U.S. Americans, to imagine a system where they wouldn't have to. That's right. And, and, and most Americans really, uh, amongst progressive Americans who, who realize that there's th serious problems with the medical system, the, the medical systems that, that are usually compared are Western Europe, which are superior to the U.S., but they're still private medicine, and they still have enormous um, problems, which the Cuban medical system has resolved. L let me just ex examine, mm -hmm. uh, let me just mention one, and, and that is the pharmaceutical industry. Most people realize that pharmaceutical industry produces a lot of drugs that are not particularly helpful, and charges outrageous fees whenever they can get a corner on the medication. And, and, and that's because of the pharmaceutical industry is so powerful and independent. One of the first things the Cuban system did was to nationalize all of the pharmacies uh, in Cuba and to centralize production. And they immediately threw out a huge number of medications because they did research and, and said, well, these medications, they don't do anything. There's absolutely no reason to prescribe them. In, in the United States, uh, there's besides having medicines that don't do anything, a lot of people are compelled. Drug companies are generally compel people to throw away expired medications. And the United States loses hundreds of billions of dollars each year throwing away medications that are perfectly good and perfectly useful simply because they're time-stamped, you know, expires in one year, 
and the medication might be very – there's actually research showing that um, medications produced 40 years ago can have 90% efficiency as, as what people have today, and, and that medications that don't have that, um, that long life expectancy, they're in specific categories. And so that's just one of many ways that Americans pay vastly excessive amounts of money for health care. Yeah, that's amazing. I hadn't I hadn't heard that about medications being able to last that long. I knew that there was problems with uh, uh, things. I mean, that they would you know almost arbitrarily set a date just so that they can sell you you know more of it. Uh, and I know that there's also environmental concerns with uh, getting rid of some of this medication as well. Oh yeah, you fl people flush it down the toilet even when they're told not to, and, and that affects the drinking water of everybody. I mean, a lot of this can, stuff cannot be filtered out. Yeah, I did a, an interview with um, a, a different person who uh, it was. Uh, she's into what she calls radical womb sovereignty, and she knows a lot about all those kinds of issues. And she was talking about the high percentage of women in the United States who no longer have regular menstruation because of all the hormones in the water supply at this point. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that, but that doesn't supply. That doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, Cuba also has natural and traditional medicine. And so what, one of the first things that they did after the revolution was to try to include all of the traditional healers into the system. And so people who use homeopathic medicines, that they were brought into the um, system. And, and, and when you go to a clinic, they will ha on, on the wall of one of the clinics that I visited, there was a whole... Um, wall directed to all of the herbs that people use in Cuba to address, to address problems. And so a lot of times a Cuban physician will say, well, why don't you use this homeopathic medicine? Why don't you try this herbal remedy? And then if that doesn't work, then come back to me. And, and so Amer American physicians have a tendency to dismiss those home remedies that have been used for generations and just go directly to the most potent medicine in the world. And a lot of times that most potent medicine in the world has really negative effects, uh, you know, like you were just describing with, uh, with influence in the menstrual cycle. A lot of times that's totally unnecessary. Yeah, and there's all the other animals in the ecosystem that are affected by, by this too. But I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the fact that the natural and traditional medicine is part of the system in Cuba. I was a medicinal herb grower for a number of years, and I don't mean cannabis when I say that. I mean all the different, uh, you know, uh, legal med medicinal herbs that, that, that people grow. And there's such a long history of the use of herbs. I mean, human beings have been using herbs for ailments for, you know, literally tens of thousands of years, you know. And in the U.S. system, uh, things are only recognized by the government as having efficacy if they have a, a sponsor that's going to put them through the process, like with the FDA or whatever, right? So yes. even though we all know that, you know, if you're constipated, prunes will help, you know, the, uh, the, the FDA no longer talks about the fact that prunes will help or lets you label prunes as having that effect because there was no corporation that was willing to sponsor prunes through that process, you know, because. Uh, yeah, and, that, and that's I'm sure that's true for many, many other med medications. Oh, totally. A prunes would just be one. I mean, there's so many, so many things. And so that's, you know, again, that this is the result of having a healthcare system that's based first and foremost on profit, not on care. And so. Yeah. And, and when I toured, when I have toured clinics, I'll see things that I never um, dreamed of. Like there'll be electric stimulate, a room for electric stimulation therapy. There'll be a room for mud therapy. And of course, you know, multiple rooms for uh, herbal therapy. And so the students in medical school in Cuba do learn traditional medicine. Now, I shouldn't say traditional, I should say modern instead of traditional. Uh, but they do learn the, the modern medicine techniques, but they also learn the homeopathic techniques, the, the cultural techniques that have been used for gen generations. Right, right. And so I, I think we should we should say something now about the um, medical school system in, in Cuba and how that's different 
and uh, not only for well, because they also bring in people from uh, from overseas to be there. I mean, yeah, maybe you could just say something about the medical. Well, I guess your daughter went to school there too, right? Right, she went to me- medical school in Cuba. Yeah, yeah, Cuba has brought students to Cuba for it started in the 1960s when Cuba was involved minimally in struggles in Africa. And in the Congo in particular, I think the first example of people being brought to Cuba to study medicine, there were students that the, the Cuban physicians who were in the Congo, they saw students studying under lamp lights at night. And so they said, well, maybe we could train you to be nurses and doctors in Cuba. So they brought people over. And some people you know, survived all the way through medical school. They revised the the method of bringing students to Cuba during the next 20 years and, and the way to select people to come to medical school. But they, for at least since the 1960s, they started bringing people in from Africa and then later uh, from Latin America. And the, the big Hurricane Mitch hit the United States. I can't remember if it was 97 or 98, but it was a huge, very devastating hurricane in Central America. And so Fidel said, listen, why don't we create instead of just bringing students in sporadically, why don't we create a, a school for students to come in from around the world? And so they did that in 1999. That was the first class of ELAM, and E-L-A-M which is the initials of the um, Escuela Latino Americana de Medicina, uh, Latin American School of Medicine. And so Students are brought in. Now they've educated something like 30, in the last 21 years, they've educated over 30,000 people from across the world to become doctors. I've interviewed 10 students who came into, 10 or 11 students who came into Cuba in order to be a doctor. And in addition to the physicians, they've, they've, they've uh, provided education for nurses and for other people. Now, if you're a Cuban and you go to medical school, of course you pay nothing to be a phys- to go to medical school there's no, there's no fee for it you have to be at the top of your high school class uh, I, mean, I mean another thing which is different the united states is different from most countries in the world is that in the united states you go to college first and then you go to medical school and most of the rest of the world in cuba included you go straight from high school into medical school and so there it's not unusual to find somebody in medical school who's 17 years old um, someone told me that he once knew a, a student from Latin America who was 16 years old studying medicine. Wow. And, and so the, the, Cuba has a different arrangement with every country. Um, the, some countries that are extremely poor, Cuba will bring students in for zero cost. But if the country can at all afford it, then Cuba makes a deal with the country for what, how, how much they, they get uh, for the student. You know, there's a country pays Cuba for the medical education. And, of course, it's always vastly less than that country would pay if they sent somebody to England or the United States or Germany for for medical education. And so then the the country will have some sort of agreement with the student that the student has to sign. The agreement that I saw most often, especially in Africa, is that if a student comes to medical school in Cuba, the the student has to uh, uh, promise to work in a government agency for five years after the, they get their medical degree, and after five years they can go into private practice if they want to. And so this has made a dramatic difference in a lot of countries because it's the exact opposite of the brain drain. And what a lot of poor countries experience, a lot of Americans do not realize how terrible this is, is that when you a poor country, when you get a degree like a medical degree you can make fantastically more money practicing medicine in western europe or the united states than you can if you return back to your home country and so the many many countries in africa or in latin america don't have enough physicians because the person gets a degree and then stays in the united states to practice medicine Uh cuba is trying to reverse that and encourage people to stay in their home countries. And the part of the medical school in Cuba is a very different culture. You're there with thousands of other people from over a 100 different countries, 
and everybody's committed to revolutionary medicine and to serving those people in their home countries who do not have the opportunity to receive medical care. And so when you go through six years of medical education in that culture, you learn a different way of thinking about medicine, that it's, you're not doing it just to make money. The culture that they create in Cuba is that you're doing to help people who need health care the most. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... So if you're a young person from one of these countries or from Cuba and you want to help people and you want to help people by being medically trained, uh, there's a way for you to do that without going way into debt. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know what the typical debt is in, in the United States. I think it's something like two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. A student in Cuba, there, there's zero medical debt. Uh, an, another thing that I should mention is that Cuba goes on medical missions. They use the word mission to describe what happens when a uh, physician or a nurse or other medical uh, technician goes to another country. And when I've gone on tours um, in Cuba, then the person would say, uh, you know, the doctor or the nurse or whoever would say, okay, well, I've been, you know, to Angola and I've been to Honduras. You know, and the typical person will list three or four countries that they've had medical experience in and that strengthens the cuban health system enormously because cuba has done such a good job of eradicating diseases like malaria and uh, uh, other types of diseases that they don't see these unless they go abroad and then physicians who go abroad to, to places like africa especially tropical africa will see a whole series of parasitic diseases that never occurred in cuba and so they'll r r learn things that they could not learn in Cuba, like Cuba has no poisonous snakes. Well, if you go to the Congo, you're damn well going to learn how to treat a poisonous snake. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and, 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 and so the, they come back with a huge variety of experience, and then, then they can go to another country and learn more and use the experience they, they got from the first country. Wow. Okay. So, and 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 also... What one thing that Cuba is well known for is going into areas where a crisis has just occurred and being the first people to send doctors in there. Yeah, that actually started in 1960. I think about one year after the revolution, there was an earthquake in Chile, and so Cuba went to Chile with a um, a team of people to deal with the earthquake. And so over the years, that practice became bigger and bigger. And so they will they will go to a country like like when Africa had an Ebola crisis. I can't remember the year that that happened, but it was after the big dengue crisis in Cuba of 1981. And so the Cuban physicians were very well trained about how to deal with a viral epidemic and go into a country and train doctors and nurses not to, to treat patients while not getting the viral infection yourself. And so that's in addition to the hurricanes the um, floods, uh, the earthquakes, all the other natural disasters. There are disease epidemics that, that Cuba goes to. Now, now, when Cuba goes to another country, it's very different than the experience of American doctors going to another country. And I think, think the best example of that is the earthquake of 2010 in Haiti. In Haiti, you might have seen, if you can remember back to 2010, you might have seen photos of American doctors going to Haiti. And there are several differences between American and Cuba doctors going to Haiti. First of all, American doctors experience what, what has been called disaster tourism. And that is they go into a country with, which have a crisis, they treat people during the day, and then they're flown by helicopter at night to a luxury hotel. And so they, go not, they know nothing of the way that the people live. They just treat them like they were treating people in a doctor's office except it's in a tent. You know, but they're still treating people while being apart from the people. 
Second thing is the American doctors go in after the crisis occurred. And third thing is that American doctors leave after the crisis is over. So they don't come in until it occurs, and they leave when it seems to be over. When Cuban doctors go in, first thing is that they've been there before. Sometimes Cuba goes into an area like Tibet that Cubans have never been to. I forget the crisis they had there. But the Cuban doctors didn't have experience with the earthquake or whatever happened in Tibet. Uh, and so they're going to the country for the first time. But usually, like in the Haiti um, earthquake of 2010, there were already hundreds of doctors in Haiti. And they all lived where the people lived. And so they, they knew what happened, what happened to people. They could see that there was a horrible water crisis and that people didn't have sufficient latrines and didn't have ways to keep the water pure. And so they could foresee things happening. Now, after the earthquake was over in Cuba, the American doctors left. The Cuban doctors stayed, which was really good because a few months after the earthquake, because of these enormous refugee camps, there was a cholera ec epidemic because the water wasn't kept fresh. So Cuban doctors had, they had been dealing with earthquake victims. Now they dealt with cholera victims. And there's virtually zero publicity about that in the United States. So when the Cuban doctors are there before and they stay after, which is almost always the case in Latin America and Africa, that they, the way that they treat people, the way that the medical is, medicine is practiced is totally different than in the U.S., yeah, and in your book, you mentioned also that the Cuban doctors in Haiti were not staying in fancy hotels, that they were actually staying in tents right there where everyone else was. Right, right. And they would know everything. You know, they would see the experiences that the people had. They would see the food that people eat. They would generally eat the same food that people ate. Right. So this is analogous to the neighborhood doctors back home. Right. It, it, and the Cuban doctors are used to it because the core of the system is the neighborhood doctors where you live with the people. Not not apart from the people. Right, right. So I, I guess some people might wonder how does how does Cuba pay for all of this? Um, it's very very difficult because Cuba of, of course has suffered the embargo, and the embargo from the United States where countries cannot um, generally the way that it works if a ship is docked in Cuba it can't then dock in the United States, and, and so there's prohibitions on doing trade with Cuba and, Cuba and the United States punishes those countries that do. One of the ways that that hurts is to make things in Cuba much more expensive. Suppose you have your own car and you have a, like a taxi business, you know, and you use your own car as a taxi, um, okay, which a lot of people do in Cuba. It's not really a taxi. It's, uh, you have a certain route, you know, that you travel around the city. In the United States, if you fix your own car and you have your own car and you use it to provide transportation, you just, when you need a part, you just go to the parts store and buy it. You can't do that in Cuba. The, the parts cannot be sh – most of their cars are made in the U.S. And so the part cannot be shipped from the U.S. It has to be shipped to France or some other country which does business with Cuba. And then Cuba pays for it from this other country. So the, the part has gone through – more than twice as much distance in transportation because Cuba's actually very close to the United States and it would be very cheap getting parts from the U.S. Okay, so that's just the example of autos. That spreads throughout the economy of all sorts of things that Cuba needs. And so there are many, many things. For Cuba earns less money than the United States does, the things that it spends money on are often more expensive. That has happened with medicine. Cuba produces a lot of its own medicines, but things like aspirin it might want to get from the United States and has to have more, uh, buy by someplace else. There's machines that were manufactured in Eastern Europe while there was a Soviet bloc. Okay, those machines will, will they'll break and they need spare parts, and they have to get they can't get spare parts from the United States. They have to get them from Europe, and so consequently, all of the medical repairs cost. More in the repairs for medical equipment cost more in Cuba, and they have less money to work with. And you were asking me how how does Cuba pay for this? Yeah, because well, I mean, I guess that okay. it's a it's a part of the national policy. In other words, Cuba has a policy that this is pri there's two things that are prior economic priority in Cuba, and that is education and medicine. And when there have been economic crises, and, and Cuba does not have enough money 
what they always do is to say that our education system will function continuously and our medical system will function continuously and those receive the priority right right and so so yeah because there was uh, they they had uh some help although not without conflict I, I understand from the soviets from the revolution in 1959 through 1991 or so but then with the collapse of the soviet union they were on their own at that point uh, and that started what was known at the time as the special period right yeah, special period in the time of peace. You know, it was, it was just like a wartime uh, uh, lack of supplies. It, it was w worse than the collapse of the Soviet Union because Cuba did the overwhelming amount of its trade with the Eastern Bloc countries. And so all of those Eastern Bloc countries had either collapsed before 1991 or did shortly thereafter. And so Cuba lost its opportunity to sell to sell its commodities. I, and at the same, I mean, there's an irony about Cuba, and that is during the revolutionary period, uh, you know, before the revolution, the revolutionaries all said, we, we cannot just be a sugar-producing country. We have to diversify our economics. And so they made an alliance with the Soviet Union uh, after the United States snubbed the revolution. And one of the things, after uh, Khrushchev was replaced by Brezhnev, one of the things that Brezhnev told, Castro, called, told Fidel Castro is Cuba will produce sugar for the Eastern Bloc countries. Mm, it's more mm. efficient for each country to specialize. And Castro would just grit his teeth, but there was re really nothing that he could do about that uh, because uh, they received so much aid from the Eastern Bloc and from the trade with the Eastern Bloc and aid from the Soviet Union that they pretty much had to go along with that. And so then 1991, the, the Soviet Union collapses. Cuba is left with a huge amount of sugar and world price of sugar plummets. Um, and so Cuba is is in a very bad economic situation then. And, and then what, what, what I forgot what were you asking me about the special period? Oh, I just was bringing it up in general as being a, a point of, of stress for all of these these systems. And and I'm glad you talked about the sugar. You mentioned the sugar because I know that the the, the part of Cuban history I'm most familiar with is the is how they had to change their agricultural system after that, you know, and had to diversify. And I was an urban farmer in Portland in the early 2000s, and Cuba was one of our inspirations because we'd seen that movie, The Power of a Community, about how they, they switched everything up and were doing lots of urban farming. And Havana was, you know, producing half of the produce that it needed within its own boundaries, et cetera, you know? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've actually seen the urban, I mean, in the, um, oh, but, between 2010 and 2019, I saw some of the urban farms in Havana, and those were still going strong. Uh, one thing I should mention about Cuba and the special period, because Americans virtually never remember this, is that Cuba was heavily involved in the Angolan War uh, from 1975 to 1988 for uh, Angolan independence. And so the Angolan War was roughly had as, roughly as much influence on Cuba as the Vietnam War did in the United States. Ah, mm -hmm. There was a huge number of people who went from Cuba to Angola to fight in its war for independence, and a huge number of people died uh, and came back with injuries. And so the Angolan War ended in 1988, and Cubans were returning from Angola, and they were hit with two things you know, by 1991 as they returned from Angola. First, first, I mean, all the injuries from Angola, but then there was the collapse of the Soviet Union, and at the same time, the AIDS epidemic from the late 1980s was starting to spread, and the greatest amount of AIDS anywhere in the world was in southern Africa, where you just had literally 300,000 Cubans had been to southern Africa, uh, and that was the greatest infection rate in the world. The second greatest infection rate was in the Caribbean. And so Cuba was set up by, in 1991 to collapse not just economically, but to collapse from AIDS because all the factors were there that would say that Cuba would have to, you know, would have a, a horrible epidemic of AIDS. And so the government, as soon as the first cases of AIDS happened, said we're going to have to ha set up sanatorium, we're ha going to have to quarantine people who came back from South Africa, and people are going to have to, uh, um, you, you know, be, we don't know what this disease is. We're going to have to cope with it. And so people in the United States usually do not remember this, 
But in the late 1980s, there was a huge outcry in the United States saying that Cuba is discriminating against uh, homosexuals by quarantining people with AIDS. Well, I mean, that was totally absurd for a lot of reasons. Uh, just a few I'll mention is that the people who came back from uh, Angola in southern Africa were not homosexuals. By and large, they had gotten AIDS from heterosexual contact. And, and uh, the AIDS epidemic in southern Africa was a heterosexual phenomenon. It was in, the, in the, this hemisphere, it was a homosexual phenomenon. That did not change until in Cuba until the early 1990s. And, of course, the U.S. has quarantined people for all sorts of diseases over the years. So it was purely hypocritical. But as soon as Cuba realized that a quarantine for AIDS did not help at all, because they realized how, the trans, how, how people became infected for the, um, from, from AIDS, they said, that, well, that's not the way you protect people from AIDS. A quarantine is pointless. And, and so... They then uh, proceeded to produce the drugs that were necessary, which was very, very difficult for them because they're very expensive drugs. Cuba did not have the currency, and it was in the economic collapse of 1991. And so Cuba then had to develop its own medications and provide them free of charge to AIDS uh, clients. And so they developed an entire protocol for AIDS. And uh, Cuba, uh, at the same time, New York, New York City and Cuba have roughly the same population. And at the same time that Cuba had 200 cases of AIDS, New York City had 43,000 cases of AIDS. Wow. And so the, the Cuban response to the AIDS crisis was fantastically more successful than the U.S. response was. And Cuba was uh, rec uh, were recognized by magazines like The Lancet, the British medical journal of The Lancet, for its successful policy concerning AIDS. Uh, and, and during the special period when Cuba was in the, 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 the crisis, there's a couple of things that happened during that time period. After the revolution, the infant mortality rate went up slightly for the first 15 years of the revolution. Most, most people are not aware of that, but if you look at the old data, the early revolutionary data said, what are we doing? The infant mortality rate continues to go up, as happens in most countries that have a lot of civil disturbance. Their infant mortality rate went down, you know, from about 1975. And so for the first time in the special period when they were in total economic collapse, Cuba's infant mortality rate was lower than the U.S. At the same time, Cuba was providing, had less food to feed people. And so they developed a policy during the special period that food went to children and women, especially pregnant women uh, and nursing mothers. And the men would have the last on the ration cards. So the average man lost 20 pounds in Cuba during the special period. As a result of this coordinated policy, they were able to survive the special period. And for the first time, uh, I think it was about 97 or 98, for the first time, Cuban life expectancy exceeded, you know, just by a few tenths of a percentage point, but it exceeded the life expectancy of the United States. And today, in 2020, we still find the same phenomena, that Cuba has a lower infant mortality rate and a higher life expectancy than the U.S., while spending less than 10% of the money per person that the U.S. does. Less than 10% per person. Yes, yes. That's phenomenal. Well, it's because of all those things, like the unnecessary insurance company, the, the, the enormously expensive hospitals that pour pollution into the air during their construction. Um, the, the, what I mentioned about drugs, you know, drugs being free in Cuba, very careful, carefully allocated. Um, and, of course, having the doctors in the community. These are just some of the things... And, of course, the United States just wastes – I mean, you can't even be a physician in the United States unless you have a small army of employees to deal with all of the insurance company paperwork. Uh, and so most physicians can't survive unless they're in a medical group where the group hires somebody to deal with 20 to 100 different insurance agencies. I mean, none of that happens in Cuba. And, of course, just the billing. I mean, the United States spent an enormous amount of money on billing and keeping paperwork. I, I, I get uh, – Medicare, because I'm over 55. I mean, I, I, I'm, personally, I must have been responsible for the destruction of a small forest for all of the paperwork that I get from Medicare. Uh, 
In Cuba, there's none of that. You have you need a medication, so the doctor says, "Here's the prescription. Go get the medication." Right, right. And so the what I oh um, there's not just differences here in leadership and in methodology. I, it strikes me, but also in in culture, isn't there? I mean that that there's the level of cooperation that's going on in, in Cuba. Yeah, and I'm going to go back 65 years, 70 years. Okay. And that is, if you look at Cuba, read about its medical history during the late 1940s and 1950s before the revolution, you find almost a civil war going on within the medical associations because a lot of the rich doctors loved having different medical appointments for which they did almost nothing. Uh, and a lot of the doctors who served poor people said the major health crisis in Cuba is low-income people who were not served. And that's when we need to change our policy so that we serve low-income people. And this raged back and forth with one group having a majority in the medical association one year, the next group having a majority the, the next year. So as you reach as you reach 1959 and the first few years afterwards, what you find is almost half the physicians leaving Cuba because they think medicine is a way that you make a lot of money. And then the people who stay are those people who recognize medicine as something that you need to do to help people out. Che Guevara was one of the central people in solidifying that ideology, that concept, that medicine is a calling. You know, medicine, uh, Fidel calls it something sacred, that uh, the doctor serves the community. And so that has been instilled in doctors in, uh, in Cuba for the 65 years of the revolution. And, I mean, you find the same division in the United States as in Cuba. I've, I've met doctors in Cuba who, you know, really the only thing they want to do is to make money, and they'd be happy to go to the U.S. if they could make more money. And on the other hand, in the United States, you, you have doctors who are really dedicated to serving people who, who need help. But what happens is that the government ideology is very, very important. It, the government ideology and corporate ideology constantly influence people going to medical school in the U.S., that it's a way to make money and influence doctors after they get out of medical school. You've got to make a lot of money. And, and in Cuba, the ideology is the opposite. And so the, there is the culture within Cuba that medicine is a calling. It's a way to serve people, and that's the reason that you go into medicine. And that's one of the reasons that people respect doctors so much in Cuba is because the nat the national culture is so completely different in Cuba as it is in the U.S. Right. And, and I think you mentioned early on in your book that even though it was, of course, a crisis to have half the doctors leave the island, that uh, it was also an opportunity because those who left were the people who would have stood in the way of the, the positive changes that ended up getting made. Yeah, or, or not would have, but did stand in the way. Okay. One of the, one, one year, when I, oh, was about eight or ten years ago that I was interviewing three doctors who had lived through the revolution. Uh, as soon as I started studying Cuba, like in 2010, 2011, um, I realized that a lot of what I needed to do was to talk to doctors who had lived through the revolution. And I thought, oh, man, i got to get down to Cuba as fast as I can and talk to doctors because in the next few years, so many of them are going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, you know, there were, there were people who had actually lived through the revolution of 1959. But one of the things the doctors told me, the, the three who I interviewed, they all agreed on the same thing. And that is that there were some doctors who were progressive, but as soon as the revolution happened, they threw up their hands and said, this isn't what I hoped for. You know, I, I, I wasn't, you know, really expecting, you know, the, the masses of poor people to have such an incredible amount of power. And, and they would be amongst those who left. And so there, were, there would also be doctors who n never showed any interest in revolutionary medicine. And, and they would say, I never thought it would do any good. I didn't really expect to have a re revolution. And once they saw what was happening, they would, uh, they would throw themselves into it totally. And one of the doctors, I, I think he's in the power of community uh, but he, in that movie. But f what he said was, that before the revolution, I thought that if somebody didn't have uh, enough to eat and, and it wasn't taken care of, it wasn't my problem. He's a pediatrician, but he said after the revolution, I realized that it was my problem. And so I asked, well, could you really predict uh, 
how somebody was going to respond to revolutionary medicine before the revolution, or was it just the way they responded after the revolution? And that is, they said it was purely after the revolution, because so many people had so many different opinions about the revolution. I mean, probably generally, the people who were for rich medicine, you know, probably had more people who left. And um, people who were for serving the people, you know, more of those stayed. But there was many, many exceptions on both sides. Right, right. I mean, this this is an interesting question in part because, you know, here in the United States, those of us who are, you know, to the left of things and, and have, you know, revolutionary tendencies or thoughts wonder how, you know, how, how will it go if there is a break? And so it's interesting to hear that it wasn't until there was a break that it could be predicted uh, how people would go. Right, absolutely. I mean, a, g a good example is right after the revolution, Cuba established rural medical service. And so after you graduated from um, medical school, you had to go to a rural area for two years. Well, of course, a, a lot of people might think, well, I'm very liberal. I want people in poor areas to get medical care and things like that as long as it's in the abstract. But then if they were to go to medical school and graduate and they had to go to the poorest parts of the United States to do medical care for two years, they might rebel against that. And there might... Uh, might be other people who would say, oh, I never wanted to do that because I'm, as an individual, I'm just a drop in the bucket. But now that everybody's doing, that's great. I'll joyfully do it. But in general, you would expect more people, you know, in the U.S. who were for medical, Medicare for all to support that, you know, after a fundamental change than before. But there would be, again, there would be exceptions on both sides. Yeah, it's just interesting that that it's hard to predict, you know, I guess that that right, part... Absolutely. On an individual level, it's really hard to predict. Yeah, it's something to keep in mind, I think, for sure. Um, you mentioned also um, about uh, one thing that U.S. doctors uh, worry about a lot and have to take out expensive insurance policies for is malpractice, and that works a little bit different in Cuba. Yeah, absolutely. No, Nobody in Cuba has malpractice insurance. One of the first years as in Cuba, uh, well, first times I've visited... I read a newspaper article about physicians and nurses and other people in a, uh, in a mental institution being sentenced to prison. And that was because in, in, uh, th they had taken blankets that were supposed to be for the mentally ill in Cuba and, they, and other supplies, and they had sold it themselves to make money off of it. So people in the institution were left uh, cold in a, a unusually cold winter in Cuba. And so the response of the government to that was to, was to send people to jail. And so what you would find, in, like in any country, you know, there's gonna, when you're practicing medicine, you're going to make a mistake. Like in, in any profession, you make mistakes. And um, the other members of the profession tend to help you to cover it up. But what happens in the United States is you, you just buy more and more insurance. <laughs> you know, if this happens right. a lot to you. Right. And, and what happens in Cuba is you're, you're pretty much told, okay, you, you need to shape up and, you know, you need to practice medicine correctly or else you're going to be kicked out of the profession. And so the physician does one of those two things. And if it's particularly egregious, the physician goes to jail. I would guess that more physicians, I mean, it's a tiny minority of physicians who would go to jail in Cuba, but still I would guess it would be more than the U.S. I've never read about a single U.S. doctor going to jail for malpractice because, you know, of the horrible things that happened to the patients. Right. But Cuba just deals with it in a very different way. And, it, and money, how much money you have to pay for insurance has nothing to do with it. Right. And now, is the is the Cuban is the 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 Cuban approach is is um is also spreading to other places to other countries? Okay, the only country that it's spread to as a system is Venezuela. Okay, Cuba mm -hmm. Cuba has missions where it goes to other countries in terms of crisis, and I have read about several of those countries. Uh, one time, I was actually able to go to Peru and just talk to Cuban physicians who worked in Peru. In each one of the countries that Cuba goes to, the doctors, well, all the medical staff are told very explicitly, like, you stay out of the politics of the country. You don't meddle in the country's politics at all. You're, you're there purely to provide medical care. And some of the countries that Cuba has gone to have been very progressive and have socialist-leaning governments. 
other countries have been reactionary and, and just, you know, very happy to have help for their medical system. So Cuba will do that regardless of what it is. But in none of the countries, even in Angola, where Cuba had the largest intervention, most militarily and, and medically, uh, did not adopt a Cuban-type system. The, what, what I've seen, what I saw in Peru, was one Cuban consultorio, the one doctor's office, and I saw one clinic. And there might have been a few more. But they had to operate under, under the restrictions of Peruvian law, and those restrictions would were not going to transform the entire medical system. And so Cuba is able to influence small parts of some countries for a limited period of time to a limited extent. But Venezuela has been the only country which has really tried to totally transform its medical system to um, be, be like the Cuban system. Right. And I'm assuming that probably happened under Chavez. Yes. Yes. That uh, during the body of dentro program inside the community. Right. Right. And so I, I think maybe just to, um, uh, start to kind of, kind of, kind of wrap this up. The uh, I, I appreciated um, this particular uh, passage here. I'm going to read from your book. It was um, uh, why is Cuba's healthcare system the best model for poor countries? And you said the current debate over healthcare in the United States is largely irrelevant to charting a path for poor countries of Africa, Latin America, Asia, and the Pacific Islands. That is because the United States squanders perhaps 10 to 20 times what is needed for a good, affordable medical system. The waste is far more than the 30% overhead that goes to insurance companies. Other sources of inefficiency include overtreatment, making the poor sicker by refusing them care, creating illnesses, exposing people to contagion through over-hospitalization, and disease-focused instead of prevention-focused research. I mean that's quite a that's quite a list of things that we're not doing right here. No, absolutely. Uh, what are, you know, there are people in the United States trying to do what they can to improve things, and several who have been to Cuba and have uh, applying what they learn in Cuba, and and they can make a significant. Uh, they can have a significant effect for the lives of a few, few people, but I think that's very good because they're showing the directions that we need to go. And it's, I mean, Medicare for all is a great system. Yeah, I mean, it's a great step that we need to take. But Medicare for all is merely a first step. If we're going to transform medicine in Cuba, I mean, transform medicine in the United States and learn from Cuba, we're going to have to go much, much further than Medicare for all. Me Medicare for all, just all it does is to apply the same type of medicine to everybody so that everybody gets it. It doesn't transform the practice of medicine or the education of medicine or the institutions of medicine. It doesn't transform any of those. And so if we want to really cut down on the cost of medicine and improve the quality of care, it's got to be something that begins with Medicare for all, but goes way, way beyond that. Right. And, you know, the politically that seems uh, like an impossibility in the United States right now, uh, though we can't predict what will happen as the nation uh, enters a, a steeper collapse. Okay. Can I read you something that I wrote Please. several years ago? Okay. And that's um, during the time of the reaction. Richard Nixon was president in 1969 to 1974. There was overwhelming pro-war pro support. I think Nixon carried 30, uh, I think he carried 49 out of 50 states. Uh, and an and, and endorsement of his war policy in Vietnam. But under his reign, there was an end to the Vietnam War. There was the start of the food stamp program, decriminalization of abortion, recognition of China, China, creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, passage of the Freedom of Information Act, formal dismantling of FBI's COINTEL program, creation of earned income tax credits, a formal ban on biological west, weapons, and passage of the Clean Water Act. And we have never won as many gains since then, whether Democrats or Republicans have been in office. And the difference between then and now was that there were many, many mass movements in the early 1970s when Nixon was president. If we're going to win massive gains, elections are nice. They're good to put things forward. But what you really need more than anything else is mass movements demanding those changes.
Right. Do you? I, I totally agree, and that is absolutely. I mean, history history shows that's how it has happened. Do you think that there is that possibility emerging now, especially with the the Black Lives Movement that's happening here? Yeah, the, the, well, don't forget that everything that we're doing, we're, we're, we either go forward or, or we go backwards. I mean, right now as we talk, there is an enormous effort to destroy the post office. Oh, I know. There, right. there is an effort to undermine Social Security until it's destroyed. Uh, they, they want to remove voting rights. They want to remove any protection of federal lands. Uh, every gain that's been won in the last 75 years, th- there is an effort to destroy it. At the same time, there is a move to push to go forward. I just saw some uh, signs this morning that said establish a postal banking system which I'm not going to go into, but people should read about Google postal banking system. And that is basically a demand to expand the post office, not to contract it. What we talked about was the way to transform the medical system. I mean, we really, we have two choices. We either go forward or we go backwards, but we're not just going to remain stagnant. Right. And so the more we push forward, the more, some people are going to say, we've already gone too far forward. We need to go even backwards. It's, it's too much that black people have voting rights. We want black people to have fewer rights, rights longer time in prisons, less opportunity to vote. Uh, and so everything we, we, we push on, we need to push on really hard. Yeah. Yeah, I totally see it. I, I think that your book uh, was, is really helpful in being inspirational in that it shows how well it it, it 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 simply shows that another world is possible yes voices for nature and peace is produced in the gila river valley new mexico usa on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied apache territory the intro music is zero g yogi by big z with narration by kelly moody of the ground shots podcast This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.